Good morning. It's Tuesday, the 19th of September, and this is Govindraj Athiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital. And today is our 100th episode. Now, our top stories and themes for the day. Advanced tax collections are up 21% in a sign of economic stability. Stock markets take a pause, but public sector bank stocks bring a surprise. Oil now heads into worrying territory. How far or up can it go? Spices inflation has been around 20% or more most of this year. Why are prices of spices not going down? And hmm, Thailand will provide tax exemptions to Indians on jewellery imported from marriage. In Thailand, of course. This is a core report with Govindraj Atiraj. And tax collections are up. The economy, as represented by tax collections, continues to grow and hold strong. Provisional advanced tax collections for this fiscal year till 16 September stood at about 355,000 crores. That's about 21% higher than advanced tax collections of the last year. Meanwhile, the government's provisional direct tax collections reached about 865,000 crore or 104 billion between April and 16 September. That's up almost 23% from the same period last fiscal for which collections were made. Now, the tax collection includes corporate tax of about 416,000 crores and personal income tax of about 447,000 crore, a Ministry of Finance statement said. The government has also issued refunds amounting to about 121,900 crores for 23-24 till the same period, that's 16 September. The growing direct tax collection displays success in the government's efforts on enforcement and use of technology in the tax collection process, the government has said. Now, let's go into the markets, where it's been a day of action. After a 11-day winning run, the stock markets took a breather. The Sensex fell 242 points to end at 67,597. It was pulled down by heavyweights like Reliance Industries, HDFC Bank and Infosys. The broader NEC Nifty 50 index fell 65 points to end at 20,127. Both benchmarks, as we've been telling you all this while, had closed at record highs last week. Now, there is a strong liquidity boost in the system, thanks, of course, to millions of new investors pouring into the market. Retail investors have gone from some 40 million to 140 million in just four years. And there is a long lineup of initial public offers, including promoters selling their stock, a figure that's already crossed about 80,000 crores this year, double of all of last year. India will see about $30 billion raised annually through primary and secondary share sales in 2024 and in the years to come as companies and their shareholders are more willing to tap the market for funding, uh, JP Morgan, Chase & Co. official told Bloomberg News. The momentum can sustain into next year and beyond as owners of Indian companies are keen to raise funds for other investments, the JP Morgan official said, adding that demand from local asset managers as well as foreign investors is also driving share sales. And did you know that there is one category of stocks which cannot be dismissed as questionable mid-caps or small caps and have been zooming in recent months? Well, it's the completely forgotten public sector bank stocks who the markets have fallen in love with post the balance sheet cleanup phase. In the last year, the PSU Bank Index has jumped 52% compared to an average 12% jump in the share prices of major private banks, according to Money Control. Shares of banks like Yuko Bank and Punjab and Sin Bank are up 223% and 179%. Bank of Maharashtra and Central Bank of India are among other banks that have gained about 140% and 123% respectively. The larger point, of course, is at this point, they're doing better than many of the private sector banks who, of course, have had a long and good run over time, but not off late. And they are, of course, all at higher bases. Since we mentioned private sector banks, HDFC Bank was up 9.2% in the same period, that's the last one year. Kotak Mahindra was negative at about 6%. ICICI Bank was stable at about 7%. Axis and Indusind Bank was strong with about 23% and 27%. Good but lower than the public sector banks. One of course does not know how long this will last and in what form. But if there is a moral of the story for the day, it would be don't bet against the government. Elsewhere, the rupee fell to a fresh record closing low against the US dollar on Monday amidst rising crude oil prices, which we will come to shortly. The rupee ended 8 paise lower at 83.27 against Friday's close of 83.19. 
The reasons cited for a weakening rupee apart from rising crude oil prices are a strong US dollar and foreign fund outflows. Last week, fresh trade figures showed a further slowdown in merchandise exports to $34 billion in August versus $37 billion in the previous year. Merchandise exports or goods, that's physical goods, have been slowing down steadily in recent months. Exports of services were somewhat steady around $26 billion. Imports slowed down too, which is what usually happens. Now, on oil prices, crude prices are now hovering around $94 a barrel, with the markets at large looking at supply caps in the fourth quarter of this year after Saudi Arabia and Russia extended supply cuts. Oil prices are now up 30% since the end of June. Brent and West Texas Intermediate, that's WTI prices, are at the highest since November and are on track for their biggest quarterly increases since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the first quarter of 2022. Interestingly, the demand outlook is not so strong, at least going by what analysts are telling. Analysts at investment bank Nomura, meanwhile, have said that a rise in crude oil prices beyond $90 a barrel, along with a rise in food prices, which we've discussed and will discuss some more, is likely to be a double whammy for Asian economies, including India. India's inflation levels are currently at 6.83, that's the headline inflation, above the Reserve Bank of India's tolerance band of 4%, that's plus minus 2%. India imports 80% of its crude requirements and since it's a net importer of crude oil, the Consumer Price Inflation Index may see a rise of 25 basis points for every 10% rise in prices of oil, Nomura Global Markets Research said in a note on Friday as quoted by BQ Prime. We expect weaker growth, higher inflation and worsening twin current account and fiscal balances if oil prices remain high, Nomura economists said. Now, to get a sense on where oil was going, I reached out to Singapore-based oil analyst Vandana Hari of Vanda Insights and began by asking her why prices were rising so high and so suddenly. Quite an interesting time to be discussing the market again, as you just mentioned, a $10 jump in the past one month. So what has changed in one word or two words? I would say it's Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has single-handedly changed the market calculus. Now, obviously, demand concerns were not going away. They had been a part of the market outlook from the start of this year. Increasingly, as it became evident that Chinese economy's sluggishness is not going away anytime soon, I think it became apparent to Saudi Arabia that there would be, by default, more of a downward pressure on prices. So what I mean by Saudi Arabia changing the calculus of the markets now, as we know, it's the de facto leader of OPEC, I would say even the de facto leader of the OPEC non-OPEC alliance. So they corralled a few of their OPEC plus peers into agreeing production cuts in April. And we talked about it in our last podcast. What has changed most dramatically, perhaps, was at the start of September, Saudi Arabia extended its unilateral 1 million barrels per day additional cut. So total now, Saudi Arabia is cutting its output by 1.5 million barrels per day. It extended that cut all the way to December. That was quite a surprise, I would say almost a shock to the market, because these kind of additional unilateral cuts are rare. When Saudi Arabia last made such a cut on top of other cuts, was back in 2021. And at the time, it had extended those cuts only for three months. And in the following months, it had brought all that supply back into the market. So this time, it has the kingdom has sent a very strong hawkish message to the market, I would say, that it is intent on keeping supply tight. It is intent on erring on the side of keeping the market undersupplied and draining the inventory. So we saw OPEC's latest monthly market outlook report last week. That was a major bullish trigger for prices last week by signaling that there would be a 3.3 million barrels per day deficit in the market in the fourth quarter of this year. So this is what it has changed the dynamics quite a bit. Right. So you've highlighted the most perhaps important factor on the supply side. How are things looking on the demand side, Bandana, particularly till the end of the year? Yes, yeah, so nothing much has changed in terms of the demand outlook. But the only perhaps factor I would like to highlight is a huge divergence 
in various analysts' projections over what might happen to Chinese oil demand. So that remains, I would say, a major X factor in the market. The IEA, the International Energy Agency, is the most bullish forecasting Chinese oil demand growth to be more than 2 million barrels per day year on year. Now, if we look at what China analysts themselves are, so Sinopec analysts, for instance, we heard one of them speaking at the APEC conference in Singapore two weeks ago, was pegging the year-on-year growth at a more modest as about 800,000 barrels per day. So we have this divergence. There's a bit of mixed signals from China. So they have been importing a much more crude year-on-year in the first eight months of the year. Their crude imports were up 15%. But why I say mixed signals is for those of us who look deeper into oil balances, it is also important to note that China has been putting away a lot of those crude imports into storage. So into strategic storage, into commercial storage, it's hard to say exactly what is going where because they are very opaque about this kind of data. But the current estimate is China has put away nearly 800,000 barrels per day of crude into storage. So the picture is far from clear with regard to Chinese oil demand, which is, you know, obviously the biggest uncertainty when one talks global oil demand. We've been hearing that there is problem with diesel because refineries are not distilling enough diesel from crude. Could you tell us why that's happening and what could be the outcome of this? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So typically when OPEC plus cuts output, and especially the Middle Eastern producers of OPEC plus cut output, which is what is happening in the current situation, since these are countries that produce relatively more of the medium and heavy grades of crude, so what happens when they curb production is that it's more the medium and the heavy grades of crude that go away from the market. The lighter, usually lighter and sweeter, comes together. So the usually lighter and sweeter grades, like the ones that the U.S. produces or the ones that come out of the North Sea or West Africa, those are still relatively in, shall I say, normal supply. But it's the medium and heavy grades which are in a deficit. And these are the grades that yield more of diesel, fuel oil, and the heavier parts of the barrel. That makes sense, right? The heavier crudes yield the heavier refined products. So that has caused a bit of a supply tightness in diesel. Some of the other factors are we had the jet high demand season, you know, summer season in Europe, North America, a lot of people flying for their holidays. So when refiners crank up, jet output that also reduces diesel output a little bit because it's from comes from sort of the similar cut so these are the main factors and then there's also additional nervousness with regard to diesel which is also another factor in pushing up the cracks and diesel prices is that it's a popular replacement for industrial users especially when natural gas prices are very high so there's a bit of nervousness with regard to natural gas in the europe markets especially going into the winter demand season So that is also perhaps adding to Europe, perhaps wanting to stockpile a little bit of diesel. You know, that creates additional tension in the system when supplies are already tight. Right. Vandana, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Govind. From rising oil prices globally, let's journey to food and spices back home. Now, spices, as we all know, are a key ingredient in most Indian staple food and life without them in one form or the other is difficult to imagine. To pick up some numbers now, food inflation in India is ruling around 9.19%, but spices inflation is around 23% and has been in the 20% range since at least the beginning of the year. Spices are about 2.5% of the overall inflation basket. Now, take jeera, the prices of which have doubled, or coriander, which has shot up, Prices of cumin, which were 300 rupees per kilo in April and was 700 rupees in July. Clove is a similar story and so on with cardamom and turmeric. If you've not been looking at these items in your shopping runs and in your shopping baskets, perhaps this is a good time to take a look. So why are spices prices shooting up so much and why, more importantly, are they not coming down? For example, could there be interventions that could bring down prices and what might that be? I spoke with Sanjeev Bisht, Chairman of the All India Spices Export Forum of India and also Vice President at ITC working in spices and other products. I began by asking him why spice prices work so consistently high. 
Govind, there are two parts to look at it. Spices is a commodity which has both domestic and export demand. So it is a commodity which gets impacted at both the end. But one of the major reasons for inflation is due to the climate change. If you look all the major spices this year, we had a cumin which went to a very great sowing. But in the month of March, there was unseasonal rainfall, which impacted the yield. In case of a turmeric, we currently are having a drought situation in Maharashtra, which is again impacting the sowings. And in case of chilies also, there was unseasonal rainfall. So weather is one of the major factors which is impacting of the crop situation. Second thing, demand led by both domestic and export impact is leading to this kind of inflation. Right. And can you tell us a little bit about domestic demand and how that's been going? And uh, have we been doing anything or either manufacturers or government being doing anything to bring down prices? So, Govind, there are two parts to it. See, if you look in terms of our demand, I think lots of pent up demand was there due to the COVID that is started in terms of consumption increase, which is being there. Indian economy also doing well. So, that's leading into consumption because people are looking in terms of higher food service requirements now, which is coming. And from a government perspective, I think the encouragement is already there in terms of higher processing, which helps to manage in terms of peak demand and requirements. So that's the way the government interventions is there. But spice is a smaller component across our categories. And all of them take a larger size because if you look at chili, it's a nine months crop, a turmeric is one year crop, and a cumin also is get once a year. So once weather impact is there, it will take at least a season to change in terms of supply. So I think that much challenges will be there. Since you mentioned prices, you know, whether it's jeera or coriander and you, you mentioned cumin, then there's clove and cardamom. Why are all prices equally affected? For example, I mean, geographically, the way we saw, is there no difference in that? See, Govin, what happens is all of them are concentrated into few areas. If you look at cumin or jeera, it's mostly grown in Rajasthan. But it's not only that phenomena is happening to India. If you look at cumin, this is also being grown in Syria and they also had a good sowing, but due to the high heat wave which is being there in those regions, the yield got impacted. So what phenomena we are seeing is not only, not only India specific, it's a global specific which is happening due to the climate change. Since you mentioned cumin and you mentioned Turkey and Syria, are we in a position to step up imports? Are there other countries which are producing more that we could import in any of these spices? So see, India is the larger producer, consumer and exporter of spices. So the world looks to India right the other way around. So we are the one who decide the prices in the international market. So there, in terms of already, if India demand is higher, so people more than import opportunity, I think the export opportunity get impacted. So those countries anyway looks Indian prices and then define in terms of their idea. Because a sense of broader numbers, Sanjeev, like for example, we have a sense in rice, let's say, that we export almost 40% of the world's consumption. So is there a similar figure for what total spices consumption and India's role in it? So, if I look on overall basis, it will change spices. But at the overall list, we almost do a $4 billion of spices export, which is roughly around 20% of the total production. But it will change on spices spices. Some spices are very high, like chilies will be around 40%. Turmeric is around 10 to 15%. Cumin is again higher export for rented crop. It's a 30 to 40% which get exported. And that's 20% of the world's production? Is that what you said? 20% of India's production. And if I look in terms of world's Overall demand supply, we almost account to almost 26% of the global spice demand in terms of export. Right. So you're saying 80% of what we produce in spices in India is consumed in India, 20% is exported. Yes. Right. Okay. Now, if you were to look ahead, what is the way forward? For example, in other areas, including rice and wheat, there have been various interventions, including, of course, banning of, let's say, non-rice exports. Wheat exports was banned last year itself. And there are several interventions that have been done already in some areas. What do you feel needs to be done to bring down prices of spices? Go with the banning thing is not going to help at all. Just like said, the ratio of export is only 15 to 20 percent. And the impact is in terms of overall supply. It's not only in India, also in globe. So it's not that it's going to change on a back factor. Key thing is in terms of how do we increase the production. And since spices is a crop where farmer get higher realizations. So we're already seeing a trend where the acreage will increase. So like chili, since farmers have got good price in last one, two years, they're going into higher acreage. The cumin sowing starts in month of November, December. The farmers have a good price. There also, I see acreage will go to increase, which automatically takes care in terms of demand, supply and the prices. So you feel that we will be able to increase acreage because obviously the realizations are good for farmers and that applies across the country? 
Yes, because spicy in general, it has been a high value crop, or we call it a value added. And the realization to farmer are much, much higher as compared to grains. And once they start getting into a return, and it's also higher value addition component. So the demands are consistent. So once we start having a farmer already realizing higher price, it's automatically will lead to higher acreage, which will stabilize the prices also. Right, Sanjeev. Thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure, Dr. Mubi Gogol. And hmm, Thailand is going all out to woo Indian tourists. Thailand is going all out to woo Indian tourists and particularly wedding groups. In order to do that, it may offer tax exemptions on jewellery imported for Indian weddings held in Thailand, a popular destination for such ceremonies, Thai Prime Minister Sreta Thavisin said on Monday in a public forum. It is, of course, interesting that Thailand has identified this as a pain point and has thought of a solution, reflecting, of course, the size of the Indian outbound tourism market and the wedding market and their combined increasing clout. Now, not surprisingly, the Thai PM also said he would like to see more flights coming into Thailand from India, likely curtailed by insufficient bilaterals right now, and he said he would take it up with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The visa itself is not an issue and can be got either easily in India or on arrival in Thailand. So presumably, more incentives were called for and thinking was involved. Thailand has approved temporary visa exemptions for Chinese and Kazakh tourists ahead of a high season. It wants to raise tourism revenue to its pre-COVID levels with a target of about $87 billion in 2024. Some 18.5 million foreign tourists have already visited Thailand this year, with some 28 million expected by the year-end. And before the pandemic, Thailand hosted a record 40 million tourists in 2019, according to Bloomberg. Now, all these numbers are much higher than India, but that's another story for another day. And that's it for me for now. On the happy note that you can safely carry your jewellery to Thailand without any duty, potentially, let me wish you a happy Ganpati. I would urge you, of course, to check on customs and customs procedures on your return into India, though. And before I go, like I said, it is our 100th podcast episode at the Core Report and the Core Report Weekend Edition. And if you were curious about my colleagues who really make this show work every day, they are Richa Jain, Joshua Thomas and Shiva Chaudhary. Here they go. Hi, my name is Richard Jain. I work as a senior program coordinator for the core. My main work is to fix speakers and guests for Govin. And it gives me immense knowledge and the show helps me to improve my knowledge, like what's going around me, if it's business or politics, etc. And during my free time, I love to paint as it works like an absolute stress buster for me. Though I have two kids, but whenever I get a little bit time, I love to paint as I like to put my thought on the canvas and it makes me really, really happy. It's difficult to find time nowadays since I have two kids and a uh, work and home to manage. But yeah, this is what I love thoroughly. Like painting is my love. And I want to thank all our listeners immensely who have supported us till now. And please support us in future as well. You have made the core a great success. Thank you so much. Hello, dear listeners. My name is Joshua Thomas. I serve as executive producer on this show, which entails overseeing the end-to-end production of each episode. Outside of podcast production, I also pursue music teaching. I teach a Montessori class once a week. I'm also involved in the Algorave movement where I code music using a live coding synthesizer called Sonic Pi. It's basically using the syntax and logic of computer languages to create live music, mostly electronic music. At this point, I'd like to shout out all the guests and listeners who engage with the show. You are all favorites of the show, whether you like it or not. And that is no joke. Thank you all so much. So the best part about working on the core report is the podcast leaves me so much more enriched, informed and optimistic about the world of business and finance. Hi, I'm Shiva and I work on the growth strategy for the podcast, the core website and the daily newsletter, which literally means getting more people like you to listen, read and subscribe to the only podcast on India's real economy. I love binge-watching shows, a little bit of cooking and listening to podcasts on the greater economy 
and personal growth. Speaking of growth, if you learn something new today, do consider sharing the Core Report podcast with your friends, family or colleagues. And I would have done my job. Thank you so much. And that's it for me once again. Have a great day ahead and see you tomorrow same time and bye for now. This was the core report with me Govind Raj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at the core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in that is www.thecore.in or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening. Thank you.